Good evening. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you to the University of Illinois Chicago, UIC Law. We're thrilled to have you here for this uh, event today as we present the 2022 Herzog Memorial Lecture. The Dean Fred F. Herzog Distinguished Visiting Scholar Lecture was established in 1988 to honor Dean Herzog and his many contributions to the development of the law and his outstanding service to the legal to legal education. Fred Herzog was born in Prague in 1907. He grew up in Austria and earned a law degree from the University of Graz in Austria. In 1935, he became the youngest federal judge in Austria and the only Jewish judge in the system. And although he was appointed judge for life, three years later after the uh, Nazi Anschluss of Austria, he was dismissed from his post because of his Jewish ancestry. He soon thereafter traveled to the US and earned a law degree at the University of Iowa. In 1947, he joined Chicago Kent College of Law as professor, associate dean, and then later dean. And in 1976, he joined this law school, then the John Marshall Law School as dean, and he served as dean twice, first from 1976 to 1983, and then again in 1990. And under his leadership, the law school group, the law school joined the Association of American Law Schools, increased its full-time faculty dramatically, upgraded the library and facilities, and acquired a new building that doubled the physical size of the law school. And Dean Herzog throughout his career received numerous awards, uh, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Decalogue Society of Lawyers and the Illinois Attorney General's Award for Outstanding Public Service. I want to thank the following staff for making today's lecture possible. Michael Huggins, Executive Director of Marketing and Communications, Peggy Ziemba, Director of Calendar and Events, and Daniel Wesley, Business Administrative Associate, Associate for Purchasing. Special thanks also, of course, to Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development and Professor Terry McMurtry Chubb, who could not have chosen a better topic to honor the legacy of Dean Herzog, Global Critical Race Feminism. I know he would be proud. Uh, so please welcome Associate Dean Terry McMurtry Chubb, who will introduce our distinguished visiting scholar and speaker tonight. Thank you, Dean Stanbauer, and hello, everyone. I just am so excited and beyond um, pleased to introduce our most distinguished guest tonight, uh, Dr. Adrian Catherine Wing. Dr. Wing is the Associate Dean for International and Comparative Law Programs and the Bessie Dutton Murray Professor at the University of Iowa College of Law, where she has taught since 1987. Additionally, she serves as the Director of the University of Iowa Center for Human Rights, as well as the Director of the France Summer Abroad Program. She has previously served as the Associate Dean for Faculty Development, and the on-site director for the London Law Consortium Semester Abroad Program. She has been, in addition, a member of the University of Iowa's Interdisciplinary African Studies faculty and North Africa Middle East faculty groups. During fall 2002, she was a visiting professor at the University of Michigan Law School. During fall 2011, she was the Betty and Wiley Aitken Distinguished Visiting Professor at Chapman Law School. After receiving her bachelor's degree, Bachelor of Arts degree from Princeton with high honors in 1978, Professor Wing earned her Master of Arts degree in African Studies from UCLA in 1979. She obtained her Doctorate of Jurisprudence degree in 1982 from Stanford Law School and was awarded the Stanford African Student Association Prize. While in law school, she served as an editor of the Stanford Journal of International Law and as an intern with the United Nations Council on, Namib on Namibia, and as Southern Africa Task Force Director of the National Black Law Students Association. Prior to joining the College of Law faculty in 1987, Professor Wing spent five years in practice in New York City with Curtis Mallet Provost Colt and Mosul, and with Rabinowitz, Boudin, Standard, Standard, Krinsky, and Lieberman, specializing in international law issues regarding Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America. She also served as a representative to the United Nations for the National Conference of Black Lawyers. Professor Wing has advised the founding fathers and mothers of three constitutions, South Africa, Palestine, and Rwanda. She organized an election observer delegation to South Africa and taught at the University of Western Cape for six summers. 
She also advised the Eritrean Ministry of Justice on Human Rights Treaties. Having studied French, Portuguese, and Swahili, she served on delega delegations to many nations, including Angola, Cuba, Egypt, Grenada, Israel, Jordan, Kenya, Lebanon, Mozambique, Namibia, Nicaragua, Palestine, Panama, Sudan, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe. She has conducted additional research in China, France, Hong Kong, Brazil, London, and Tunisia. Author of more than 140 publications, Dr. Wing is the mother and originator of Critical Race Feminism and the editor of the book, Critical Race Feminism, a reader, and Global Critical Race Feminism, an international reader, both from NYU Press, as well as co-editor of the Richard Delgado Reader. Her US-oriented scholarship has focused on race and gender discrimination, including autobiographical narratives and such topics as critical race feminism and poverty and the future of critical race theory. Um, we use uh, both of Professor Wing's texts here in our critical race and gender studies program uh, at UIC Law. For Dr. Wing's international scholarship has emphasized two regions, Africa, specifically South Africa and the Middle East, in particular, the Palestinian legal system, international law and feminism, international law and race, and the Arab world and women's rights are among the topics of her articles. Further, Dr. Wing has held leadership positions in various organizations. Of note, she currently serves on the American Journal of International Law Board of Editors. On a personal note, Dr. Wing taught me both critical race theory and critical race feminism while I was a law student at the University of Iowa. She has mentored me personally and professionally for over 20 years. My heart is grateful that you have joined us this evening, Critical Race Mom. And I thank you for sharing the gift of you and your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dean McMurtry Chubb for, for that uh, introduction. Uh, I am very grateful uh, to have known you uh, since you were a wonder child uh, law student. And of course, I'm exceptionally proud of all that you have achieved uh, up to this point. And I know you are going to go way further in the years to come. And I hope I'm around uh, to see this, uh, see all that will happen. I would like to thank uh, the University of Illinois Chicago for inviting me to do the Fred F. Herzog Memorial Lecture. I didn't know that he had a connection uh, to the University of Iowa. Uh, and I'd like to thank Dean Spanbauer um, for giving an overview of, of his life. And I, I do hope uh, that what I will say in my remarks would be something he would be very, very interested in. And so I'm going to uh, show a, a PowerPoint and um, I'm going to also hopefully leave uh, uh, some minutes for questions. And if um, we don't get through all of the questions, everyone is uh, welcome to contact me uh, at uh, the University of Iowa. You can Google my name, you see my spelling of my name uh, and you can email me there. I'm, I'm happy to follow up and I'm uh, happy to engage uh, with you on a, a wide variety of topics. So now I will share my screen and we will get started. Okay, now uh, everybody can see that, uh, I believe, hopefully, right? All right, you can, everybody can see that, right, Dean? Uh, yes, oh, yes ma'am. Right. Okay, good. So you see the title of my presentation, uh, you've heard I'm the editor of two readers, one critical race feminism, one global critical race feminism, just thus this title. And uh, in this presentation, I'm going to explain 
uh, what what these uh, these entities are that I've been engaged in for 30 years or more, and give you some applications for how we can use a, a, a global critical race feminist approach to discuss issues uh, involving international law. So the outline for what I hope to do, uh, first, I'm going to spend a little bit of time about the attacks that have happened involving critical race theory. And then I'm going to define in more depth, uh, both uh, CRF and GCRF. And then in terms of solutions or examples to problems that are confronting uh, women of color, I'm going to give um, some examples about Black women in international law in various guises. I'm also going to give what I call a praxis example, praxis being the intersection of uh, theory and practice, and that will involve constitution making. As you've heard, I was involved helping the founding mothers and fathers of three constitutions. I will speak about two of them here. And then I will uh, mention a solution involving coalition building. And then I will uh, close with the future. And uh, then we'll have our questions. OK, so first, I'm sure everyone in this audience uh, has heard about some of the attacks on critical race theory. Uh, I joined uh, the critical race theory movement from the beginning in the, the late 80s when I became a professor. And I thought I'd retire maybe five years from now and I'd have this esoteric little specialty and people would say, and what did you do while you were, you know, while you were professing? Hmm. But now the entire country, <laughs> including um, also people in other countries has heard about critical race theory Unfortunately, a lot of what they have heard is negative, and I hope to dispel uh, some of that, um, you know, material here today. And uh, the bottom line, uh, all of these attacks that we have been getting in the media uh, have been um, concretized uh, and described by one of the critical race theory foremothers, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. If you want just one name with critical race theory, you Google or go on, you know, Westlaw, uh, Lexis, et cetera, uh, and look her up and, and you will see uh, her vast body of work and all of the citations. And she is a professor at both UCLA and Columbia Law Schools. And what she has said, and I agree, is they've lumped everything together critical race theory, the 1619 Project, whiteness studies, talking about white privilege. What they have in common is that they are discourses that refuse to participate in the lie that America has triumphantly overcome its racist history, that everything is behind us. None of these projects except it's all behind us. So after President Trump uh, did an executive order back in September 2020, uh, where he was aiming at banning uh, critical race theory in the federal government, um, everybody who, who loves critical race theory was happy when, when Trump was defeated. It, we thought, okay, that's it. We're done with these attacks and we can go back to what we've been doing. But instead, uh, many states, uh, Republican-led states, which includes the state of Iowa, uh, have passed laws that uh, are aimed at banning critical race theory uh, in the school systems. The one that we have in Iowa uh, is uh, focusing on what they call divisive concepts. So most of these laws actually don't use the word critical race theory at all. In the case of Iowa's law, uh, it does not ban me from next spring uh, teaching critical race theory, um, but it has had a, a big effect on the K through 12 level and uh, all of the school districts around the state and the various universities have been scrambling to figure out what's allowed or not allowed. And uh, the ACLU from Iowa has uh, critiqued 
this, this Iowa law and the ACLU in each state where these laws are being passed has legal strategies that they are considering uh, in terms of how to attack these laws. So, uh, so far the attacks uh, have not focused on critical race feminism in particular. I mean, we come under the umbrella of critical race theory, but you, you haven't heard all of the media saying, and we've got to do something to ban critical race feminism. So uh, now, uh, and, and of course I hope that doesn't happen, but now I want to go from the attacks uh, that have been on critical race uh, theory writ large and help define uh, for you what is critical race feminism, which I'm going to be uh, focusing on in this presentation, and where does it come from? And so on the left is uh, one of my readers on critical race feminism, and uh, it is best known in law for the concept of intersectionality and Kim Crenshaw is uh, the foremother for intersectionality within uh, the law. And there are other disciplines where uh, people are doing intersectional analysis, but in law, we look to Crenshaw. Then also uh, intersectionality doesn't just mean uh, race or gender or race and gender, i.e. women of color, but it also should be looked at much more broadly. And so this list of um, the, on the right, you have to think about people's identities involving all of these categories plus some others that I'm going to talk about. So in other words, something might be happening to me as an African-American female, senior citizen, heterosexual with various disabilities, I guess from, you know, upper, upper middle class in terms of my income or the intellectual class. And then I am a mainstream Protestant. So I could be facing discrimination on some of those identities. Uh, and also at the same time, no privileging. So as a law professor, there's privileging, but if I'm just out on the street or with some of my seven children uh, on the street, uh, we, they don't care what is my profession. They may just see us as a group of people of color that uh, they want to discriminate against. So where does the critical and critical race feminism come from? It comes from critical legal studies. And so on the left, you are seeing a, a book on the top left by my former Stanford professor, Mark Kelman, a book uh, he did in the 70s uh, on critical legal studies. And then below that, you're seeing something from the nutshell series about deconstruction uh, because critical legal studies came about um, when there were progressive white men in the 70s who uh, were in college, they were anti-war, they were pro-civil rights, they then went to law school, some of them became law professors, and when they hit law school, uh, they had a reaction that maybe some of you may have today that, wait, there's something weird about what we're learning. And so they developed a class crit critique of the law. In other words, the law is just not neutral and objective, and you just should talk about justices as if they were widgets. But no, you have to look at the class uh, that these judges come from. You have to look at the issues that are considered important to the law up to today. So they develop critical legal studies, which uses the concept of deconstruction. Let me break apart what's happening. And that concept came from European postmodernists like Foucault and Derrida and others. Okay, so then you begin to have some people of color who become professors. They are interested in critical legal studies, but they're like, you guys don't really deal with class. Uh, you deal with class, but you don't understand race. And they thought, the crits thought, well, we're dealing with race because it's subsumed within class. But people of color who became professors, such as on the top right, Professor Richard Delgado and his wife, Professor Jean Stefansik, and below the late Professor Derek Bell, they came up with race analysis of what was going on in uh, the American legal system. 
So uh, eventually a whole variety of books has come out over the past couple of decades. This is not new information by any means. So if any of you are looking to pick a book uh, to delve deeper, the top left in the red and white book is the Crenshaw Reader from like 1996. And it's a big, dense, uh, high theory reader uh, law students, some of them may be able to do it, but it's not suitable at all for the general public. And this is one of the problems. The work that has been done in uh, critical race theory is meant for graduate level, law school level. It's not aimed at the general public, much less at anybody below the college uh, level at all. If you want something easier to get through or quicker, the book below in, in, in black and white and red lettering uh, is a, a small, small book by um, Delgado and Stefansic, and that reads much quicker. Uh, I'd also like to point out that Professor Bell did the book in the bottom middle, and he's done a variety of books, some of which are very fast reading, very intriguing, and I highly recommend them to you. And then on uh, the picture below, um, the picture to the left of Professor Bell is a reader that I did, uh, Law Unbound, which is the Delgado reader, uh, which uh, is um, the work of Richard Delgado. So you get critical race theory developing, but then uh, you get critique of that and you get people of color who become professors and who feel critical race theory. It's just kind of looking at the black white binary, what's happened to black people in America. But there's a lot of other things that have happened in America that go beyond that. So on this page, you are actually seeing a number of other areas where you can look up some books, but mainly law review articles that have been um, developed. And so we now have uh, LATCRIT, uh, Latino and Latina Critical Studies. We have Queer Race Crit uh, about uh, LGBTQ people of color. And on the top right, that is uh, Professor Frank Valdez, who is involved with LATCRIT and Queer Race Crit. We have critical white studies. There's a whole reader uh, by Delgado uh, and Stefansic. We have Indian or Native American crit uh, on the left. Uh, Professor Robert Williams is one of those uh, authors to the bottom of uh, Professor Williams is Professor Robert Chang. He and others have been involved with Asian crit. We've developed something called e-crit or empirical crit which is uh, mainly done by people who have JD PhDs and they crunch numbers to prove, uh, to prove the nature of racism. So rather than just having a narrative, which we like to talk about uh, how racist things are, people in ECRIT back it up with uh, you know, analysis of different phenomena. And Osaji Obasogi, and with the glasses uh, in the middle there, he's one of the authors there. We now have discrit or disability crit. Professor Rabia Belt is involved with that. We have Desi crit about South Asians and the law. And, and Vinay Harpalani uh, to the right bottom is involved with that. We even have critical race masculinities by Professor uh, Devin Carbato, who started his career at Iowa and is at UCLA. UCLA. So all of these have evolved and uh, obviously by their titles have an emphasis or a focus on uh, things that may intersect with the original material, but then go deeper into all of these other areas. Right now, these are not under attack. People haven't noticed them, uh, but we could see, you know, at any moment, somebody will decide, aha, let's attack Asian crit or, you know, some other one of these. So, Critical race feminism is dealing is coming from therefore not only critical legal studies and critical race theory, but it's also coming from two aspects of feminism, uh, feminist jurisprudence by people like Catherine McKinnon and the late Deborah Rohde, also my former prof at Stanford, and also we draw from non lawyers who are very famous. And those include Black women like uh, Angela Davis and Bell Hooks and Alice Walker and others. So uh, in other words, critical race feminism is a, a huge melange 
of all of these intersectionalities. And besides Professor Crenshaw, who you see in the middle on the right, you wouldn't know it, but I'm right next to her. Uh, this picture was many years ago when I was still dyeing my hair instead of its now natural color. And then on the left of me is, uh, 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 of course, uh, one of our, our famous uh, authors, uh, the most famous feminist uh, authors for sure. And uh, we have several, two women featured, other women featured who are both uh, critical race feminists uh, who are quite senior, Mari Matsuda at University of Hawaii, and Angela Harris, who's now retired from UC Davis. So what does it mean when you intersect all of these identities and come up with critical race feminism? Why do we intersect these people? And that's because, unfortunately, the economic situation of women of color and those as defined there in our heteropatriarchal world is, is, is worse. Uh, for these women than for white women or men of color. And that's true whether the women are in the United States or they are outside of the United States. So what does this mean? In other words, critical race feminists are a race intervention in feminist discourse at the same time that uh, it, there are feminist interventions in race discourse. So this is, was all US oriented. Um, we go beyond the US, as I will do in this uh, presentation, to the global. And you heard in my bio, or you may have picked up in my bio, that I'm an international lawyer, as well as somebody that's focused on US law. So the global in critical race feminism is coming from global theory, uh, including something called TWAIL, third world approaches to international law. And these are some of the professors uh, male and female who are involved in TWAIL. Uh, some of them are from other countries, uh, many of whom though got their JDs or their PhDs or SJDs in the United States. So just as an example of something that uh, involves cr global critical race theory, think about COVID. We know COVID has disproportionately affected people of color uh, in different countries. There's whole, uh, there are whole, almost continents that haven't had enough access to vaccines or, or other materials. And so using a, a global critical race theory approach, you would say this is discriminatory and we need to do things so that people who are confronting uh, the various variants of um, you know, COVID uh, will get effective protection, especially if there could be another variant coming soon that might be quite, quite serious. Uh, and so in my family, I've had nearly 90 relatives affected by COVID, nine zero. I don't have any friends of mine who are teaching, who are, who are white, who have anywhere near this number. Unfortunately, I've lost seven family members to COVID, uh, plus another five or six to other illnesses that were exacerbated by the system being overrun by COVID. So here you see two of my relatives, a 44-year-old nephew, father of four, who passed away, and my 90-year-old aunt uh, in the Bronx, from the Bronx, who passed away as well. Okay, so all of that gives you a little bit of more understanding of global critical race theory. So then when you say global critical race feminism, here you see a reader that I did uh, involving women from all over the world. And so we focus on a range of topics ranging from international feminism, human rights, uh, international business, all aspects of international and comparative law. Okay, so I've given you the background about what is global critical race feminism. Now we're gonna use that approach and see if it helps us uh, to find solutions to the problems that are affecting women of color around the world. So the first thing I'm going to talk about will be the example of the International Human Rights of Black Women. 
And if you're interested in reading in more depth, there is this book uh, edited by uh, Professor Jeremy Levitt from Florida A&M that has a whole series of articles, including one of mine. And uh, so I'm gonna give you uh, just uh, some examples of uh, what kinds of questions we would raise. Uh, and so the issues uh, that I wrote about and do write about are, you know, what are the issues affecting black women in Africa and how might they be different uh, from issues that would affect women in Latin America, Asia, the Caribbean and Europe. So for example, some of the issues in some of the countries can involve any of the topics on the left. Now, these are in any country. They can be in any country, uh, but uh, certain parts of the world, uh, certain practices may be more prevalent than others. So for instance, polygamy is legal in most countries in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, it's not legal in the US. I have written though about how we have de facto polygamy in the US among the black American community. So uh, all of these topics, uh, there are issues that affect women of color and there are um, therefore solutions that have to be based on analyzing uh, these practices in the cultural context in which they arrive. I will only mention one on the bottom, one issue on the bottom uh, that's in my work, featured in my work called spirit injury. And my thesis is that um, many people can suffer from spirit injury which is the psychological effect of any ism, whether it's racism, sexism, homophobia, or other isms. And so uh, we need cures. We need legal cures for spirit injury. And uh, that depends on the scale of the, the problem. And I'll, I'll talk more about this. So these are some of the problems or issues that uh, we have to look at in terms of uh, trying to focus and improving the legal status of women of color. And to do that, we would have to look at certain international legal documents uh, to help. And these include some of the major treaties, which are the uh, International Civil and Political uh, Covenant, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Women's Convention, and its recommendation 28 deals specifically with intersectionality. The Convention on Rights of the Child has recommendations uh, as does CEDAW, all involving intersectionality. CERD, which is the Race Discrimination Convention, also uh, has a recommendation on intersectionality. The Banjul Charter uh, is the African Regional Charter on Human Rights. Um, that would have to be looked at if uh, we're concerned with issues affecting women in Africa. And then the Banjul Charters had a spinoff, a treaty that's called the Women's Protocol. And this is a, a real contribution to international law that almost nobody knows about uh, this uh, protocol. So in particular, what does this document do? A document made in Africa with heavy input from African women. So just as an example, we don't have time to go through all of these, uh, but it is an amazing document that deals with all of these issues, uh, including uh, prohibiting violence from both public and private sources. And that has to do with violence from the state and what we would call domestic violence. It talks about female genital surgeries or also called female genital mutilation or circumcision and says such a practice uh, should be prohibited. And of course, it's been a very controversial practice over the the decades. And it looks at things like equal pay, uh, having uh, paid maternity leave, something we don't have yet in the US. And so there are a lot of very, very progressive uh, items, including authorizing abortion in the case of rape or incest, which is new in international law uh, and uh, quite, quite uh, progressive. We also would have to look at the entities that could help women of color. Um, and they include the former uh, Rwanda Tribunal, 
uh, that talked about, had a case talking about rape in international law. There was a Sierra Leone Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a Liberian TRC, the International Criminal Court. In other words, if you wanted to help African women, you need to not only look at the various international laws, you have to look at the entities where you would raise uh, the use of these laws. Also, you have to look at the roles that Black women play uh, to see, uh, you know, are they making a difference? How are they making a difference? In other words, they're not just victims looking for others to help them. So we have Black women who are in a variety of positions that I'll, I'll show you here uh, momentarily. So we have Black women who are current or former presidents of nations. We have women who are parliamentarians. You may or may not know that Rwanda has a majority female parliament, uh, the highest number of women in the world, 60 something percent. Uh, and they did that because like many countries, they have gender quota for women. And then women won a large number of the, the seats that were open or open gender. We have women who have been Nobel prize winners. We have uh, quite a few women, black women, who have been judges on the international level. On the left is the American judge, uh, Gabrielle Kirk McDonald, who at one point was president of the former Yugoslav tribunal. We have now a black woman on the International Court of Justice, Julia uh, Sebutinde, and then uh, the former prosecutor from the International Criminal Court, Fatou Bensouda, uh, these are people at the very top of the international law hierarchies. Plus, we have many women who have become law professors uh, uh, in this field of, uh, of working in international law on the rights of women. And these are some of those uh, women. The woman on the right, uh, Leslie Obiora, teaches at Arizona, but she was actually a Nigerian cabinet minister at one point dealing with oil. And uh, that was, of course, quite an experience. And then we have uh, women featured on this page uh, who are members of the treaty bodies. In other words, each international treaty has a committee that's uh, called the treaty body committee. And uh, on the top left, Gay McDougal is a African-American who's on the third committee. We have black women who are special reporters. We have them who are special advisors, women who are center directors. In other words, we are playing a lot of different roles. Unfortunately, we've had some who've passed away. And uh, these are some of my sheroes, the late Professor Hope Lewis and the late Professor Golder Tiro Butcher. So that was one example of, of using a, a global critical race feminist approach to come up with some ideas, look at some issues, think about people and institutions. Another example I'm going to give you quite briefly in terms of solutions to help uh, women of color involves what I call praxis, intersectional constitution making. And uh, these are two of the three constitutions where I was helping the founding mothers and fathers. And so uh, to me, constitution making is a form of treating group spirit injury. In other words, a great constitution can help deal with the injuries that uh, may have afflicted people for centuries. So I have a book I'm working on, on healing spirit injuries. And if you wanted to see my first uh, uh, foray into talking about spirit injury, this uh, old article from now 1990, 91 is where I first talk about uh, spirit injury. And here, uh, this was my global critical race feminist practice or uh, praxis. Once again, you wouldn't know it, but on the left there, that's me. And uh, I brought over 17 American uh, lawyers and law professors and law students. And we assisted the African National Congress Constitution Committee in drafting uh, the post-apartheid uh, constitution. On the left next to me is Tabo Mbeki, uh, and this was 1991. He ultimately became the second black president after Nelson Mandela. In the second picture in the middle is Dalla Omar, who was a member of the ANC Constitution Committee, and he became the first minister of justice. And on the right are uh, me with other members of the Constitutional Committee. All of these people became judges and parliamentarians, cabinet members, etc. 
Uh, here are two of the judges uh, that I worked with from the new constitutional court. So that's me in a black outfit there in the middle. Uh, on the top right, uh, Judge Albie Sachs. Uh, he uh, was part of the Constitution Committee and was on the Constitutional Court, now retired. On the bottom, uh, we have uh, uh, Justice Zach Yacoub, who uh, is blind, and he uh, was also on the Constitutional Court. He came and visited me in um, Iowa, and that's with on the bottom with my former dean, Bill Hines. And so let me just, uh, that the South African Constitution is full of so many incredible things. But uh, this uh, intersectional clause, the equality clause, I want to highlight for you, you should study it. Can you imagine the US Constitution having a clause that would forbid uh, discrimination on all of those grounds, including gender and sex and sexual orientation? And they view it in an intersectional way. So they're not having the problem we have of Title VII, where, OK, are you suing on race? Are you suing on gender? You can be suing on all of those intersectionally. And this Constitution also has uh, a clause I, I showed you from the uh, Women's Protocol that forbids uh, violence from either public or private sources. So can you imagine like domestic violence being in our, uh, banning domestic violence being in our constitution? Now, there are many conflicts though in every constitution. So the constitution also uh, says there's a role for language and culture and language and culture are often quite sexist. Uh, in, in what they permit. So you can have a conflict between equality and what is permitted in the different cultures that exist in South Africa. So uh, the South African constitution permits, uh, you know, uh, uh, sexual orientation equality. And so they then changed the, the, changed the state laws and made uh, gay marriage legal. And their constitution was the first one to have sexual orientation in it. So an issue has, issues have come up. So on the right, uh, once again, you might or may not recognize me, but could I have three husbands in South Africa? They have polygamy for the 11 black ethnic groups. So could I have those three men as husbands? The one on the right is my current husband. The one on the left is my ex-husband. The one on the far left is a boyfriend that I had when I was in, in uh, high school. So could I go to South Africa and say, hey, look, I want equality and polygamy? I think pretty much the answer is no. Uh, they're not going to permit women to have three husbands, even though men could have three wives. Then on the left uh, is a friend of ours, a white man on the bottom, uh, Dr. Charlie Johnson. He's gay, and he considers these three men to be his husbands who are from different African countries, and he's in the process of getting a divorce from his American uh, spouse. And so he asked me, could he move with these three men to South Africa and have a polygamous homosexual marriage? Now, I don't know the answer, but I think no. Because once again, uh, you have to look at the culture. The culture allows polygamy, but homosexuality was not part of the culture. And so if you want to have a gay marriage, you can go and have a civil marriage, but you wouldn't go into a village and ask the village under its customs to have a homosexual marriage, much less a polygamous homosexual marriage. But these are questions that uh, we'll see how they get answered over time. So uh, one of the other lovely things uh, about this constitution is it requires considering international law. Uh, the US is supposed to do that, but you all are probably familiar that or the US doesn't do it very well. And they may consider foreign law. And uh, that is uh, wonderful. And then briefly about Rwanda, they came up with some other categories for identity. So that's me on the left. They came up with a child-headed households concept because after the genocide, so many adults were killed that you had teenagers taking care of unrelated children, which is what you're seeing on the, the left. And then um, I participated uh, along with other people from various countries in Africa and also some from the US and advising their uh, constitutional commission. And at the bottom right, uh, some of their commissioners who I'd met in Rwanda came to Iowa 
and uh, talked with our students as the founding fathers and mothers. They talked in my Con Law One class, which is of course quite marvelous for American students to meet uh, to meet them. So uh, another solution, and we're getting to the end, uh, involves coalition building. So if you are interested in a, in a social justice uh, approach to deal with issues uh, affecting women of color around the world, you can't do that in isolation. You have to do it intersecting with many, many different uh, non-governmental organizations. And I wanna just highlight that Kim Crenshaw has her own NGO, uh, the African American Policy Forum. It focuses mainly on women of color, but since all of the attacks on critical race theory, it also is doing a variety of other things uh, more broadly uh, in critical race theory. So near the end, the future. Remember, women of color are not just victims. We will struggle and we will transcend. We have to look at where does the most promise lie for the application of an intersectional approach over the next 10 years? And how can we as lawyers harness the power of global intersectional analysis in our interactions and practice? How can we intersect political change, economic change, healthcare change? To me, one approach is service. Service is the rent we pay for living on the planet. That's not my saying, but I use that to help guide my life in my 40 years as a lawyer. So coming toward conclusion, two points. It gets very depressing, uh, the situation we're in in America and in the world, very depressing. I have to stay positive because, uh, you know, I have seven children. I have, you know, my 18th grandchild is coming. I've taught thousands of students. I stay in touch with many, probably hundreds of my former students who are out there doing great things like Dean uh, McMurtry Chubb. And so I have to stay positive despite the, the horrors. And so I'm inspired. Uh, one of my heroes is the late president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela. And he said, the struggle is my life. In other words, we're not gonna end racism, sexism, homophobia, or any other kind of evil in our lifetime. These are things of many centuries. And so they will exist for many centuries. So when my you know, great, great, great grandson is alive, he may be uh, dealing with these same issues that we're dealing with now. So you will each be judged, not on whether did you end these horrors, but what was the nature of the struggle that you were involved in at each phase of your life, whether you're a uh, you know, high school student, a law student, a, uh, or whether you're a young lawyer or an older lawyer or a dean or a, a president of a university or a president of a country. What is it that you will do involved in the struggle for justice? So in conclusion, I want to end with a poem from my Shiro, uh, and I have a few sheroes, and some of you may know the poem and some of you may not, but it is one that always gives me strength and was particularly relevant uh, when we were recently watching the Senate confirmation hearings for uh, now Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. So it is still I rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trap me in the very dirt, but still like dust I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room, just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my backyard. You may shoot me with your, oop, I'm missing a line. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I'll rise. 
Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history, shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide, leaving behind nights of terror and fear. I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise. I rise, I rise.